The 6.5 podcast is back and we are talking about IBM Linux One. There have been a lot of announcements coming out and more insights and strategy has been tracking it for, I think, 14 years, uh, which has been uh, which has been pretty, uh, pretty awesome to do. Uh, we track all forms of compute and solutions infrastructure. And I just love rolling into New York uh, and, and discussing this. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Marcel from IBM. Marcel, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks, Pat. Happy to be here. Excited. Yeah, totally. You know, it's um, it just seems like the rate of change increases every single year, and it's not our our imagination. And I'm sure you're seeing this from your clients. There's a lot of things they ask, right? They they want to uh, lower costs. They want to drive revenue. They want to accelerate uh, ex everything that they're doing, even operationally. One of the things I wanted to hone in on uh, in this conversation is, is IT efficiency. So let's talk about in relation to your clients, how are they expressing the need for IT uh, efficiency uh, in this in this day and age? I mean, I think it's it's on multiple levels, right? It's the um, it's the reality of the bottom line, right? Um, and just saving cost on power and data center footprint. But but and it gets goes beyond that. In the extreme, it's, you know, how do we avoid having to break ground and start, you know, build a new data center? And we're actually seeing that becoming more and more common now as there's no more power. There's no more physical footprint in, in existing data centers. And, you know, CIOs and CTOs are being pressed to do more and more with, with less, right? Ultimately, especially in now the age of AI, where they've got to figure out where to put that you know, those, those uh, NVIDIA powered uh, AI enabled systems, there's just no more room, no more space. And, and they've got it. So they've got to figure out how to do more with less. Um, and that that's really a, a theme that we're seeing becoming quite common now across the set of clients that we work with. Yeah. Marcel, has it changed a, a bit? Because, you know, I've been in uh, I've been in tech for I guess this is my 35th year. Uh, I'm old. Uh, don't hold it against me. Um, some people call it experience, but you know similar types of 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 needs and requirements that I've heard. What makes right now different? Is it the giant power sucking sound of of GPUs and and generative AI that's making this even even more difficult? That's definitely a large part of it. I mean, I think everybody wants that, you know, additional competitive advantage of having, you know, AI helping them grow and accelerate innovation and in business. Um, the reality is, you know, there's a lot of existing footprint out there that's, you know, been around for a while and has sprawled over time and created significant complexity and debt. And, uh, you know, budgets aren't getting bigger. Data centers are, aren't getting bigger. Power grids aren't getting, uh, aren't getting more power. Um, you know, I, this is an interesting statistic. You know, data centers worldwide are now sucking over a thousand terawatt hours of power. Um, there's just no more to give, right? And um, so people are having to figure out how to deal with that, right? While addressing the business needs of agility, resilience, uh, intelligence, right? Um, so the CIOs and CTOs are, are just really in a bad spot and trying to figure out how to deal with all of this. Yeah, Marcel, I've done more uh, speaking with uh, CIOs and CTOs uh, this year than I did in the previous uh, 15. And one of the biggest reasons is is listen everybody uh everybody wants to focus on outcomes and and that will that will be true but there's this technological layer that sits on top of it that seems to change every 90 days uh and and so i was in europe uh, in fact uh, last week i was in italy and london and i did uh two cio roundtables with uh yeah definitely in the fortune uh, fortune 500 and they have expressed exactly uh, what you had said uh, related to, to efficiency. Um, my follow-up here is, what are the main ways that you're seeing enterprises uh, becoming, becoming more, more efficient? Well, I mean, so if you sort of look at 
the landscape today around traditional distributed architectures, what you'll see is there's a ton of heavily underutilized infrastructure out there. I mean, what we're observing is, you know, average utilizations of like 16 to 22 percent on traditional scale out our infrastructure. And that, you know, there are very good reasons for why that infrastructure runs at those utilizations. I mean, you're typically you know, potentially bound by memory. Um, you're, you're managing to peak utilizations on small, you know, granular pieces of infrastructure. So you can't aggregate workloads and get to a better sort of peak to average utilization as a result. And, and so if you think about that, that's like 84% of your, your, your cycles are spent essentially idling, doing nothing useful, right? That's a huge, huge opportunity to improve on efficiencies in the data center. Um, and so, so that's that in my mind is, is where a lot of the low hanging fruit is today. We need to sort of take a step back and rethink this traditional sort of pizza box scale out uh, design point for how we do data centers. Is it really planning for peak? Is that uh, where a lot of the gaps are where you know, this is your peak and, you know, I'm going to, even though average is down here, right. I have to plan, I have to plan for, for peak. You have to plan for peak and the peak to average is just a large, there's a huge difference between the two, just because of the way, you know, we're, we're distributing workloads and giving every workload its own system, for instance. And that, that's definitely a big part of it. Yeah. So is, is part of the solution here being able to intersperse uh, jobs that keeps your IT working all the time, uh, maybe some element of batch, maybe some you know different types of, of of functions in there. Yeah, I mean that's that's like that's the idea. So if you can aggregate workloads, right, so that you you can really take advantage of sort of averaging out those peaks and valleys across a large set of workloads. That's where you have this magic of being able to reduce the peak to average to something that's much smaller. And that, that's largely the magic that sits behind Linux One. Well, yeah, Linux One is, is really unique in its sort of scale out on scale up architecture. It's really sort of you, what you want to think about it is it's like 85 you know, metal servers that have this magic ability to share compute IO and memory resources dynamically and non-disruptively under the covers. So that as you sort of aggregate workloads across those 85 servers, you're able to really average out the peaks and valleys and really drive a much more efficient use of the infrastructure uh, resources and on those systems. And that's where, you know, we can get to 95% uh, yeah. utilization on average with a Linux one system. Oh, I love that. 85%. Um, hey, can you, for, for the audience out there that may not be as familiar with the latest uh, Linux one uh, out there, Talk about what you mean by the 85 servers, because possibly some of the viewers back here, if you're or if you're just listening in a podcast, might be thinking 85 servers, 85 boxes, 85 trays that are going down a fleet uh, of uh, of servers here. Yeah, no, a Linux One system is essentially a large, uh, large uh, Uber Linux and Linux server that uh, you can divide up the resources within the server into 85, what we call logical partitions. And those 85 logical partitions can maintain air gap like isolation between them. But what's really neat about that is, is that you can actually share the compute, the IO and the memory underneath those 85 partitions, and you can dynamically reassociate them non-disruptively for the workloads that are running across those 85 partitions. So it's, it is essentially like 85 metal servers in a box that have this magic ability to share all their resources and dynamically yeah. move the resources around. That no, makes a lot of sense. I, I, I love LPARs. <laughs> uh, that's been, you know, it's, it's been something that I've been, you know, learning about, uh, forever. Uh, very cool. Hey, let's, um, let's dive into, I would call it a related, uh, some would say tangential, uh, type of conversation and that's about, uh, sustainability. Okay. And it's interesting. I always like to say it depends on what year. Uh, we talk about sustainability. It's it's either it leads with green and it's good for the world, or if it's man, let's save money. 
Uh, and then, you know, we, we come back another year and it's, hey, let's find a way to save money. And, oh, it's green, right? <laughs> uh, but, you know, my trips to Europe, I mean, it's it's very much even sustainability is is really high on that list. So how does sustainability fit into this efficiency uh, conversation for a modern infrastructure? I, I think, you know, good corporate citizenship continues to be a reality, right? Every every enterprise has a net zero strategy stated and and that makes a ton of sense, right? We all want to do good for the world and and so on. But the I think what corp what what a lot of the enterprises are realizing is there's actual value from a, a bottom line perspective yes. from that as well. So it's sort of like icing on the cake when hey, we can be good corporate citizens, but we're also helping ourselves become a more agile, right? Uh, a, uh, into enterprise because we're doing more with less ultimately. So yes, I think it's actually both. I, I definitely see the, that that both are kind of playing out now in the industry. Yeah, I'm seeing that too. And it's funny, uh, sometimes we get asked to predict uh, energy prices, which is, is super tough when you see a quadrupling of the energy draw from hyperscaler data centers yeah. and us kind of juggling. Uh, it was it was crazy in, in, in one week, you know, we went from uh, in the United States, nuclear energy, nuclear power bad uh, to literally every major company. It's now on their green list. And yeah. I think what that did is really drove the conversation about how much power we're going to be uh, generating here uh, and, and need need to do that. And, you know, there's a lot of fear out there that, you know, the the, the average citizen is going to have to pay more for their power. Like, why should I pay? 20 to 30 percent of my power to drive my home uh, when I might not be getting a benefit out of it. So I absolutely think that that's one conversation that's not getting uh, a lot of, of play here that absolutely uh, that absolutely uh, will. So uh, how does Linux one uh, fit into that? I know you talked about, uh, you know, first of all, uh, workload utilization. Uh, that, that plays into that. If I can get to 85% utilization rate on there as well, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would also uh, guess that uh, Linux One consolidation uh, is a is an unlock too. But I, I'll, I'll let you I'll let you oh, answer yeah. the question here. Oh yeah, no, I mean from a consolidation perspective, it, it's it's a, it's it's a great story, right? It, I mean. When you get to that higher utilization using an order of magnitude less cores, there's inherent savings there from a total cost of ownership. And if you look at the recent study that we published with the Signal 6.5, um, you know, there's we, 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 we saw 44 to 75 percent reduction in total cost of ownership. A large part of that actually is software, 94 percent reduction in software cost. And that gets down to just how software is licensed and priced, right? It's typically priced per core. So if you need 10 times less cores to do the same amount of work, that turns into a dramatic savings from a software uh, cost perspective. The added efficiencies also uh, from that consolidation are energy. So we're seeing 65 to 91% reduction in, in energy required to run those workloads and an up to 82% reduction in data center space. So it's a savings on, like better efficiency just translates into savings on all those dimensions, be it total cost of ownership, be it space, be it power, right? Just doing more with less, right? Yeah, it also seems like, uh, you know, a, a typical workflow might be, okay, I've got Linux, I'm doing Linux one workloads. Uh, I need to ETL some of the, a lot of the data out to do uh, AI on, on that. And, you know, there's, there's energy that goes into there. You've got, um, you know, not to mention the potential uh, security uh, challenge of, of move. By the way, that's true moving data anywhere. Anywhere, yeah. Uh, but it seems like there is an efficiency play of, of running uh, certain uh, AI workloads on top of an IBM Linux one, too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I think we just announced the uh, availability of the Spire accelerators, right, which are integrated AI accelerators for inferencing workloads. That just translates into, you know, saving on data movement, reducing, uh, reducing a risk around data movement, of course, as well, reducing latency. Um, so it, it, 
just that that in itself also great story for how we're improving efficiency around AI scenarios. Um, where especially where you're talking about data serving and application serving scenarios. That makes sense. Yeah, I love uh, I love the Spire architecture. I mean, first of all, you've got on chip. Uh, if you need kind of the maximum bandwidth uh, tightly coupled to the CPU, and then you've got the Spire cards. Uh, if you want a little extra oomph uh, to be able to do uh, uh, to do uh, to do more there, I mean, and it just makes sense uh, uh, to me. Uh, particularly across uh, a certain uh, set of set of workloads, so it's been really good to see um, Linux One uh, uh, step step up here. Marcel, this is this is great, and this is a great I wouldn't call it strategic or philosophical uh, conversation here, but obviously you have clients that are reflecting all of this data and 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 the thesis in in real life. Can you can you talk about a, a few of them? Absolutely. I, I mean, we've got a long list of, of client references in this space, Pat. Um, one, one, for instance, is uh, one of the largest casualty insurers worldwide out of Asia. Um, they were an x86 only shop. Uh, their regulata regulators were telling them they need to address their carbon footprint. It was out of control. Um, they transitioned to Linux One everything. And uh, they reduced their electricity consumption by 70%. Uh, their software costs were, came down by 90%. And their floor space came down by 75%. Um, awesome. Another, sorry, go ahead. No, I just said that's awesome. I, I love the uh, x86, uh, you know, getting off of x86 and nothing yet x86, but that, that is where you can unlock a, a lot of, uh, a lot of these efficiency gains. Yeah, and so we've got countless examples. Like um, another one would be a European financial institution. Uh, they moved uh, their Oracle database off of x86 to Linux One. Uh, they saw 15 to one core consolidation, 70% uh, reduction in CO2, and a 60% reduction in software licensing. Um, so I I could go on all day with examples like this. It's just, there. It, it's proven technology. We've seen it um, over and over again with clients. Marcel, uh, are these uh, are these case studies up on your, up on the Linux One uh, website? They are. Okay. Yes, they are. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, everybody out there, we are not talking about just theory. This is actual uh, results. Uh, I loved, um, uh, you know, Signal 65 results are one thing. I'm a big fan of Signal 65. Uh, I co-founded that company, uh, but also putting it in real life uh, makes a huge difference. So with that, I want to thank you for uh, coming on the the show here. And um, yeah, keep keep innovating uh, out there with uh, Linux One and whether it's, you know, efficiency or effectiveness or everything in between. You've been doing it for for years and it's just uh, it's great to see uh, you stepping up to the plate and doing even more. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So that's Marcel Mitron, IBM Fellow and CTO, IBM Linux One. We are talking about IT efficiency in the context of Linux One. Hope you enjoyed this conversation. Check out all the content about IBM Linux One out there on the 6.5 Media site, but also my analyst firm, More Insights and Strategy. This is something that uh, analyst Matt Kimball talks about uh, already. So thank you for tuning in and take care.